Hey there, it's Niver, and this is Niver Niverland, the Milwaukee episodes. I'm kind of blown away right now, to be honest. I'm sitting here in the Harbor House, one of the Bartolotta restaurants. I just had uh, occasion to talk with ba- Paul Bartolotta, uh, the company's leader. And I'm surrounded by the lake and the art museum and all that this view of Milwaukee has to offer. And I'm a little blown away. I just met with one of my... I think he's a hero now. I mean, I knew of him, um, this guy, Paul Bartolota, but right now I think he's a hero. Just the way I hear him talk about his community and what's important to him and then his drive and the way that he's looking forward to what's next. This is a good discussion with uh, someone who's famous and important in our industry. Please listen in. Niver Niver Lands, the Milwaukee episodes, Paul Bartolota. Niver Niverland, thank you for joining me on Niver Niverland. The name of my podcast is my name, and I'm here with somebody else with a great name, Bartolota. Uh, Paul Bartolota from Milwaukee, numerous restaurants, Bartolota Restaurant Group. And I'm a li- like I say, I was just telling you, I'm a little, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you met with me. You know, you have a certain stature in the city. You're a legend in a lot of people's minds, right? I don't know how you feel about that. You know, the James Beard nods, you know, like you've been doing this since 93, man. You have a 30th year anniversary coming up. Mm, doing it since 77, <laughs> 76. Right. And um, that's a lot of years. It's a ton of years, man. I'm feeling younger every day. You look really good. You look, how's your energy? Good. My energy is scarily good. Have you changed and I just, kind of and I, habits and stuff like that? Or have you no, just... but I was just at a conference where they talked about the new uh, longevity economy by a, a guy from MIT. And I just, it inspired me to continue to think that I'm as young as I am. And everybody wants to tell me, well, you're, you know, you're in your 60s now, you're old. And I'm like, but I feel like I'm in my 40s. And this guy wrote this whole piece, uh, this book called The uh, Longevity Economy. And it really talks about how generationally we're living from 85 to 100 now you know at one point it was like 72 and then it was 78 and then it was like early 80s and now now the generation that's growing up now are going to live late 80s to to people we're going to have a lot of people in their hundreds it's not going to be an anomaly Mm. it's going to be like oh there's one lady continue right we're going to have more and more medicine is better we're eating better um just everything about our lives has changed um and it's changed longevity yeah I think about longevity. I'm 53, I'm, so I've still very proud. young. A kid. Yeah, I'm. I'm youthful. You're 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 at the halftime of your life, <laughs> right? You know, and I'm I'm still working circles around people. Hell yeah, you know I I like that about me and um, that I'm able to still like get in the trenches and, and do it. You know, I would say you know I flew a red eye to be here this morning. You flew a red eye. I flew a red eye to be here. That's how important you were for me to Dude, be here. This is what I'm saying. Hey, this is really here. cool. Like, I'm here for you, I? Paul. And 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 Julie said to me, uh, who is uh, our, our our head of our marketing, she said to me, "Do you need a couple of espressos before you sit down with uh, <laughs> with Tim?" And I'm and I'm like, I can never have too many espressos. My daughter knows the other line, which is, "You can never too, put too much olive oil on anything." And the other one is, "You can never have too many good espressos." Now, a bad espresso, well, that's like you know nails on a chalkboard. But a good espresso. All day long. All day long. All, I mean, literally Numerous. all day long. Do you stick the Italian rules of cream in your coffee? Like you say espressos. Do you have like the cappuccino thing in the morning? Do you like? So I'm really particular about my cappuccino because in America, we literally think we know something about cappuccino and we know nothing. So first of all, it is one shot of espresso, mm. never two. Number two, you never heat up the milk too hot. Number three, you aerate the milk so it's creamy and warm. So you can take an espresso right after it's made and go glug, 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 be done and leave. In America, you get an espresso and it's like scalded milk. It's hot. It's more of a latte, if anything. Yeah. And then, of course, whenever I go to a place, I said, when you make it, and, I, and I'm in the mood for a cappuccino, I said, would you make a cappuccino? I said, do you make it with one espresso or two? And they're like, oh, always two. Like, it's a badge of honor. Like, we make a better oh. one because we give two. And I'm like, I'm like, 
No, wrong. You know, um, you'd be at forty espressos a day. If, if two, so, if you had so, <laughs> so I do love I do love my cappuccino, mm. but I have one cappuccino in the morning. Yep. Um, I have a little machine that makes the right kind of foam at my home, uh, and it's perfect. And then I have the Ely machine because I'm a, a long time lifer Ely fan, yeah. um, and I can tell you the story. But but so I have my Ely, and, and then I have wherever I move at my sister's house, in my office, uh, in my in in the break room at our office, um, I have an espresso machine on my desk. Um, just because for me, it isn't the caffeine. What people don't understand is it's the flavor, it's the intensity, it's just like, it's a it's a repause, it's this moment of ah. And and people think, oh, you know, there's, you're taking so much caffeine. An espresso has about a third the caffeine of a cup of American drip coffee because the experience Traction is so different. You know, when you when you run an espresso for, you know, 20 seconds, uh, 17 to 24 seconds, um, you can only extract so much caffeine. But you think, oh, it's so intense because the grind is different, because the tossatura is different. It the, the you know everything about the, how it's made and how the high pressure for the extraction. But when you drip coffee and it takes three four minutes to drip, every time it's running, you're continuing to extract way more caffeine. So. For me, it's a punctuation point at the end of a meal. It's a, it's that moment of of pause late morning. It's that, you know, get done with lunch, boom, one espresso. Three in the afternoon, the afternoon blues, boom, one espresso. You know, for so for me, it, I I sip them all so day. It's like tea almost. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, and I just I love the flavor. The Those, chocolateiness the, of yeah, a really bitter, good espresso when it's when it's bad, it's pretty bad though. Yeah. So it's, it's you're out there navigating. You're out there, yeah, yeah. I'd rather have a I'd rather have a bad American coffee, a thousand times over, because I can always add a little hot water to it if it's like over roasted or burnt. Uh, you know, definitely not a Starbucks guy. Sorry about yeah. that. Just can't do it. I think they came with blonde because I think the research is telling them that their coffee is caffeinated and burned and <laughs> and not always the greatest beans. Sorry, Mister Starbucks. But uh, but I'm but you know I'm I love my Duncan because it's low acid. I can drink it all Absolutely. day. Absolutely. So, not very fancy of me. Well, it doesn't matter, right? Like it's what you, you know, like the well Milwaukee though. Like you have some fancy restaurants and you do fine dining, but Milwaukee's not necessarily mm -hmm. built on a fancy uh, on a fancy framework, right? You know, it's a pretty hard working blue collar town. You have mm -hmm. Sobelmans, you mm -hmm. have Usingers, you know, mm -hmm. like these kind of like real hearty kind of american a lot of history a lot of history yeah we need her family has been around forever so there's there's a lot of really great history you know uh, kegels and and you know there's a lot of restaurants that are you know the three brothers there's a lot of really cool places in the city yeah that have history so in mama Tosa, i think that's... we're starting to become that ourselves though actually because we're coming up on our 30th anniversary right now yeah. and i realized wow 30 years that that's kind of a long time that's like three decades and it's insanely long time yeah and, 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 we're, and we're vibrant i mean let's face it let's not kid ourselves covid was was gruesome but the fact is the community has supported us as we think that we've supported our community oh you're and definitely we're, putting we're really grateful for what they've done well, I think we're still really here. grateful for what you've done. You know, I mean, you, know, you talk I guess it's about a building. Street, but, it sure but, is. But we're we're nothing without our people, and we're nothing without our customers. So yeah. at the end of the day, you know, great people we're makes not. happy customers, yeah. and then hopefully, our uh, our organization demonstrates that we're we're invested in our community. Hey, for sure. good people don't seem in short supply here. Like honestly, you know, you even get in the Uber, right? And dude's like, hey, how you guys doing? You know, and where are you from? Because I don't, I don't know if I don't look like I'm from here or whatever. Where mm -hmm. are you from? And and you know, there's just a, a real openness, a civic pride. I don't I don't know. I, that's the real reason. Milwaukee's I'm at back. a tipping point. Um, I think that we're we're changing generationally. I think it's a way more younger city than people are uh -huh. aware of. Um, I think that the old guard built this incredible foundation for us to then modernize it in a way. Uh, I think there's a lot of incredible development going on in the city. Um, there are not many cities that can really tout the fact that they have uh, been awarded both national political conventions. We are in yeah, the DNC, which which didn't happen. Now we have mm -hmm. the RNC coming up uh, next year, and you know it speaks volumes to the fact that we're a city that is is on the rise. 
and that we're, we're a little bit of a sleeper. People don't really realize the beauty of our lakefront, uh, the diversity of our community, the ethnic diversity of the city. Um, you know, we have our problems like any other city, but honestly, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of development. There was a period where everyone was moving out to the suburbs. Now everybody's moving back downtown. The city is vibrant. The restaurants are better than ever. It's just the, the, the diverse. I mean, right now, the, the Beard Foundation is, uh, has awarded uh, as semifinalists three restaurants in three different categories. That's a big deal for us, you know? So we're, so good. we're excited for the city. Well, I can it's good news. Yeah. I can feel it. Yeah, uh, we, I was here with some buddies, mm -hmm. super casually, just going to see a. I call it the Mets game. It was a mm -hmm. Brewers game against mm -hmm. the Mets. Mm -hmm. I went to see the Mets. It's okay. Anyway, we'll forgive you. All right, you're rooting for the Brewers, right? I was rooting for myself having a good time in your city, and okay. I did. I okay. did. Like I was yeah. kind of blown away. By, by the way, we also have this team called the Bucks. Oh, um, they're kind of good. Uh, <laughs> they have this one guy. Uh, that's pretty amazing, but everybody on the team is amazing. We have an incredible coach who is really invested in the community. Uh, we're actually doing a big fundraiser for one of his charities. Uh, so, um, and Kill ownership it. of the Bucks is really committed to Milwaukee and Peter yeah. Fagan, who who manages uh, the Bucks, is just fantastic guy. He's doing a lot for city of Milwaukee. So, again, we've just got to, you know, we we're we're growing, we're changing, we're evolving, we're getting better. Yeah. And it's, it's it's clear. Like I say, there is a, a total vibe. We were down in Walker's Point when we were here last and just ate at some, you know, regular old joints in town, you know, nothing too fancy, but it all felt good and there was a mood. In fact, um, uh, I talked about it a little bit this morning. I went to Tin Widow while we were waiting for a seat at Odd Duck and the I, uh, we've been enamored. We had been enamored with the town, I guess a full day. We went to the game and we're just like, damn, this is nice. We walked right by here. Beautiful, beautiful day. And anyways, we walked in kind of, you know, enamored with the city. And I looked at the bartender. I go, hey, I go, why is why is it cool here? Is, is that accurate? It feels really cool. And he's like, yeah, we're cool now. <laughs> we're cool now. We're okay, cool I now. like that. Gosh, I always thought we were pretty cool, but okay, well, we're yeah, cooler. No, it, I think he felt validated in feeling cool versus we know we're cool. Melissa described it as we don't have to act like we're cool. We don't act like we're cool. We're just from Milwaukee. We're just easy going. Doesn't we're, matter who we're you Milwaukee are. Milwaukee cool. Yeah, you're Milwaukee cool. So, but he literally said to me, I go, what, is there a, a turning point or a thing? And he said to me, he goes, the box won. And then Giannis decided to stay. And I go, all right, well, that's a cool example for you. I didn't know if that like united the whole city. I'm sure that win did. By the way, just to let you know. We did their parties. Yeah. So man. the <laughs> night, the night, the night that the Bucks won, it was funny because we got a call from the Bucks ownership the the day before, and they said, you know, if we win tomorrow, we'll we'll actually have won the championship. I'm like, yeah, this is exciting. <laughs> he goes, well, we really didn't plan a party, and if we win, we need to do something. And he said, Paul, could you? I mean, I know this is short notice, and and it was like right in the middle of COVID, and we're like, ah, uh, whatever it takes. So I said, give me two hours. And so I called him back and said, listen, <laughs> you're going to win. But if by chance you don't, and I mobilize everything, just help me just cover my call. I don't care, you know, I can't afford to absorb like and have it not happen. He said, no, 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 absolutely. We'll do whatever it takes. You know, you just said, you know, they were really cool about it. Like, so they said, but can you do this? So I, I thought about it. I said, how do I celebrate the bucks in a restaurant last minute without doing something for 400 people? And how do you do something special and literally, it was sort of a turning point, even for the organization, because I think everyone realized that there was Nash, there was like a city national pride for Milwaukee, um, and then it was also our company was chosen, which was an enormous honor. They could have gone anywhere, right? Uh, and they called us, and so we said, "How do we over deliver? How do we go over the top? This is about making money. This is this is about this is about doing it's a party." It, it, a, this this is the celebration and that we were chosen to be even a part of it. So we told everybody, guys, we don't tell our friends, we don't tell our spouses, we don't, we just like, we're gonna do this. And I called every chef and I say, listen, if I gave you a station, what could you pull together for 400 people tomorrow? Like, so my, my Italian restaurant, oh, so my Italian restaurant Juan is like, I'm gonna do a pasta, I'll do a handmade pasta and a risotto. I said, I got some filling. I said, I can make this, I can I'm like, great, done. And I called, you know, my steakhouse. I said, listen, what could we do? I said, can I get a live grill? I said, yeah, I'll put an old fire out on the patio. I said, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, grill a bunch of steaks and we'll do some grilled, you know, steaks and chicken. And then I said, okay. And then I had, 
my, I just gotten a delivery of these live langoustines and some lobsters that I was gonna bring in here for an event. And I said, hey, let's set up another grill and let's do grilled langoustines and, and, and baby lobsters. And they're like, okay. And then uh, the, the restaurant here at Harbor House was like, I'll do a raw bar and I'll do a great fish and chips. And everybody sort of like, every restaurant, the French bistro was like, ah, I'm gonna do, and everybody like said, I've got stuff I can do. And so every chef came in autonomously and they, this was a matter of their pride and we pulled together and then, you know, ah, we need green up lighting and we need all green lights in the place and whatever. And then we get it all set up and then we turn on the TV to watch the game, not knowing whether there's really going to be a oh, party shit. or not. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, we're like, and all of a sudden it was like, we won. And I, I have goosebumps just thinking about it just because you could hear the, you could hear the deer district, you could hear the noise of of quite a, you could hear the roars and just the entire city like light up and yet we had to keep it super quiet because the players and the ownership and and the investors and and the management and the and the, the off back office of the the bucks and everybody you know city council people were all coming in here and and it was just it had to be super quiet and we had this whole big the buses showed up and some of the players over their cars and they were come out and we had like a receiving line everybody got a glass of champagne on the way in and we were free pouring you know french champagne of super high quality and it was just it was really Ugh. so much fun it was amazing it was really a lot of fun but you're right it was certainly a turning point for the city um because i think the city just realized that we're a big city mm -hmm. you know yeah I mean, we're a smaller city, but we we can we can play we can punch uh, above our weight class for sure. I think that's totally what I'm feeling here. And you know, the architecture is beautiful. The access to the lake and the way that it feels here, all the green spaces. Yeah, it just there's a lot of you know like a lot of the romance of a big city here. I think without any of the pretense, I'm discovering that you know everybody's just kind of regular, but obviously. It, there's like aspirational figures around here. So um, so you'd agree then that kind of this win was something that kind of unified or reunified or made people think at least in their city, hey, we have this civic pride. And you it's think people have been building on that. Well, I think it was the, the, the getting the DNC was the first major, really major thing that happened. Um, and then getting the Ryder Cup up at Kohler, oh sure, um, which was a huge deal for the state and 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 for the city. Uh, so there was there's a whole series of things, but it's this, it's like this drip 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 of great things that are happening. And now it's like faucets on, and things are happening, and there are some really exciting things happening that, in the city that are going to be happening very soon. So it's really cool. Oh, I'm, I love it. Well, more um, more more coming. Yeah, talk to me about how you keep a restaurant open for thirty years. Um, <laughs> Wait, luck, uh, skill, uh, acumen. I mean, obviously, your brother Joe and you had a partnership and a yeah. familial ship yeah. that kind of. Yeah. yeah so, so I think it is the fact that we built a portfolio of restaurants that are very diverse. Because we didn't feel like we could do five restaurantes or five lake parks or five harbor houses. Uh, there's one harbor house. And you're in it. Yeah. So at the end sweet. of the day, each place that we go and we look at, we think about how we ideate a concept that will offer something new and diverse to our dining community. We have 120,000, uh, we have 170,000 people in our database for our rewards program. There's 120,000 of them that are, that are within, uh, that are actually live within the area. And there's, almost 80,000 of their active, active users. So they're there because they, um, they like the diversity of our portfolio. Um, they earn and are rewarded on their, their patronage. And, um, and you just see it in their face. There's, it, it's, it's a matter of pride that they're a member of the Bartolotta Club, uh, the Bartolotta Rewards Program. And it was funny because right coming out of COVID, I had a very prominent attorney in the city of Milwaukee who came to me and said, I wanna show you this. And he showed me his father's rewards card that was almost completely worn out. 
And he said, I hope you don't mind, but when he passed, I asked if I could have his reward points put on mine. He's a very prominent attorney. He wasn't doing it for the points or for the money or the discounts. He didn't care. He's a very wealthy guy and he's near retirement. He did it because it kept him connected with his dad. And what it said to me is we're part of that connection. His favorite restaurant was Ristorante in Wauwatosa and Lake Park Beach. So they would go to those two the most. And he, we was at Lake Park that night and he said to me, you know, we live right up the way here. And he said, we come here all the time. My dad used to love this place. He was a supporter of you when you first opened Ristorante. So he's been supporting your company um, since then. Um, a former governor, uh, uh, earlier than so my time. Cool. But it was really prideful to see that. Um, and it meant a lot to me, but I, I get these stories where people generationally hear and see what's going on in, in our, um, in our city and in our organization and we watch them we see we've watched the life stages and the life moments that these people have had i had a a family the other night that was like children 40 year old children and grandmother and we were three generations at the table and it was the girls night out so it was like two daughters their mom and and two of their their female daughter kids and it was girls night out and they're having dinner at my restaurant and the girls were quite young, but the, the daughters were late 40s and the mom was 80. And then when, when I went to say hello, they explained this all to me. And then the, the grandmother say, said to me, I used to come here with my mom. And when you hear these kind of stories, you just think, wow, that's crazy. How and the, 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 and the daughters years. were like, I came here when I was a young girl. And you realize that's almost four generations that have been touched at some point or another by our restaurant and we are built into it and when they trust you they know well, you well you know, the well, memories and traditions we've been invested in our community and when we did a a little retreat last summer um you know you you know you do business retreats and you talk about what you're doing and who you are and what you're and one of the questions i asked the team is like what is our purpose because we never really ask you know you have a, mi a mission and a vision for your company but do you ever really have a purpose like why are you on this earth like what is your purpose and to make things better and we started talking about it and what the team came back, not me or my sister Maria or any family members, they, the team came back and said, our purpose is to elevate the social fabric of the communities in which we operate. And we operate in city of Milwaukee, but we operate in Mequon. We operate in, in Waukesha. We operate in Greendale. We operate in Wauwatosa. And each one of those hamlets or each one of those villages or cities or counties that we work in we are deeply invested in what's important to them in that community. So whether it's Tosa Fest or whether it's Greendale Days or whether everywhere we go, we make sure. When, when Joe and I were first starting in Wauwatosa 30 years ago, we were doing spaghetti dinners and different activities and events. We have always been invested in all of that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because then people reinvest in you. They just, you know, it's a it's a nice, fulfilling cycle of things. But you know, making memories and those traditions and then, you know, offering yourself out to the community is a big deal, man. And I don't know, like I had a place called the Strip Club, a little steakhouse and it, and it lasted for 10 years and it was kind of a perfect story, front cover to the back cover, a really cool thing. And it was nice to be able to, you know, walk away. Nobody got hurt and wow, they own 10 years for a restaurant. That's, that's really good. But, you know, obviously, you know, a thing with my mom's name on it, Moochie's, I want that to endure and endure and endure, you know, in her name, in my name, which it's not Moochie's, but, you know, I live in that Italian part of my life. Everybody has a little Italian in them. And and it's it always seems to be whenever there is, there's it's always sort of the dominant gene. It should um, be. I don't know why that is. But I will tell you, there's an old saying that restaurants don't get tired owners do mm -hmm. and truly to answer the earlier question what have we done we've evolved yeah we, you know we go back to the hairstylist that knows how to cut our hair or the barber or my wife goes to a hairstylist who knows how to color her hair or how to cut her hair whatever you know she doesn't want to go every day to a new stylist because you never know what you're going to get you want the tried and true so i think our restaurants have a certain amount of comfort and sort of a standard of excellence, a standard of hospitality um, that the guests can actually understand and expect and, and know what that expectation is that we'll deliver. But in addition, 
we push ourselves to evolve through the thousands of events that we've done from author dinners to cookbooks to to uh, to guest chefs to winemaker dinners to themed dinners that we come up with the high stakes dinner we just did or a truffle dinner or a garlic fest or or um, or here we're doing a you know celebration of lobster and at or it's you know season for you know stone crab uh, or it's the season for you know base gal. But we we always are thinking about what we can do to create some excitement from a business perspective. We do it on off days to like optimize the utilization of the the space. So we're busy on on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We may not be as busy, but we're busy on the weekends for sure. And coming up with these things keeps our rewards members engaged and yeah, like yearning products. for more. Yeah. Like what what what's next? In December, it's like champagne night and we do a whole big champagne dinner where we get all the top champagne houses to, to put together a portfolio. And now that they're competing to, ha to have the pole position, they're like, oh, I'm gonna give you my grand millisime, I'm gonna give you this. And, and all of a sudden you end up with this this list, nobody wants to show up with their generic non-vintage. All of a sudden, they're giving you a vintage. And, and you know, at the end, then now you got a couple of people saying, hey, I want to bring in some small growers. And, and at the end of the day, you end up with, so what started several years ago is an early one. It was like, oh, a series of sort of non -vintage. All of a sudden, now it's all vintage champagne. It's like special stuff. And and the guests really have learned to appreciate and look forward. And, you know, now I'm working on a private label caviar for the company. And so we're going to do a caviar dinner where the people are going to be, you know, they're going to get, you know, drunk on caviar. And uh. then, and, and I get people drunk on white truffles and black truffles. You know, we've been doing <laughs> white truffle and black truffle dinners in this market for almost 30 years. So we think that we've introduced some new things and we continue to push ourselves to come up with new ideas, I'm working on a, a bouillabaisse based festival, or you know, whatever we can do by bringing all yeah. my Mediterranean fish from Europe. So it's it won't be like American fish trying to make it. I'm going to bring it right from 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 Italy and France, you know. So differentiating, we, yeah, we, innovating, we, staying we in the face we of the guests, people on a journey, yeah, you know. Uh, it's it adds to the experience factor, you know, uh, relevancy. So this is what we're doing now. It gives the management on the inside something to chew into other Correct. than just service. Yeah, they get excited about yeah. putting on an event. Somebody's coming over, or, you know, the chef's coming, we're going to cook this. You know, like those are the things that, you know, I, I it's really lovely to welcome that back in our lives after a couple of years of, you know, sitting on our thumbs and just waiting for this to kind of pass. So cool. I love the energy. I really feel like 2023 is probably going to be the year that we see where we land a little bit more, obviously, than 2022, the way this year that 22 uh, started out with Omicron and all that. So I'm really looking forward to what 2023 brings is a full year, not necessarily out from under what COVID has been to us. But, you know, if we can stay free and clear of some of the BS that's kind of clouded the waters, it'd be nice to see how we we really land. I well, it'll be interesting. I think there's a lot of change in the dynamic of the industry. Uh, I think that the labor force has changed. Mm -hmm. I think that the consumers have changed. Mm -hmm. I think our business models are evolving. If you don't, it's the quicker that if you don't evolve, you die. So we're continually looking at how do we revisit each thing we do and how do we add more value to the guest experience along the way. Yeah. Ballsy call to close all your places during COVID. Um, in retrospect, maybe. At the moment, it was born out of the values by which we started our company. You know, my brother and I had long conversations of, you know, when we prioritize what what, what our values were going to be, we went back and forth at great length of should it be, you know, most people say, hey, take care of the guest. Guest is everything. We've actually opted to say we're going to take care of our employees first. Um, because without our employees, we have nothing, but our employees are going to make happy, happy employees. You know, uh, no guests are going to, uh, you know, who was it that said this? Um, you know, some, you know, maybe it was Simon Sinek or something like this, but he said something like, to, it's, it's brilliant, you know, that, that no one is going to love your company until your employees love your company. And so we've always made employees number one and investing in them. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. We're a gigantic organization. We're, we're 17 businesses across a pretty big real estate and growing. So um, 
but our values haven't changed. So closing the restaurants was, am I gonna put making money above the health of my employees, the potential safety? I was speaking to friends of mine in Northern Italy, in Verona, in Venice, in, in Bergamo, in Milano, and they were just telling me, Paul, there are people dying. There are people like three days before they got picked up. People are dying everywhere. It is like the plague. And I heard that and I said, and it's coming here because we're seeing it and New York was already hit. And so- yeah. Seattle how it, was bad yeah, early. Yeah, and, yeah and, and, and I had just got back from a, a, a trip in Paris with my sister Maria and a, and a friend of mine that we were doing some you know, R&D for, for interior design stuff. And we landed at O'Hare and there were people, everybody was wearing masks coming off the plane. I'm like- Wow, and you know, and and you know, we got up to Milwaukee, and a couple of days later, and all of a sudden, sure enough, like the world had literally ended, and I closed the restaurants before the state closed the state, just because I said that we already seen the reservations dropping, dropping, dropping because people were getting scared, and then I said to myself, well, so are my employees, why am I asking these people to come to work when their their parents are terrified? So I'm going to take these young kids, and say, hey, come to work. I'm like, why for business? So I thought, okay, I'll close and we'll ride this out a week, two weeks, you know, a month, whatever. I said, we'll survive this, but let's protect the health and safety of our employees first. I just didn't think it would last as long as it did <laughs> and, and have to deal with so many things because, you know, we had some of our restaurants are in Milwaukee and some are in Waukesha and in, uh, on the west side, you know, in that county, you know, COVID never really happened. And then in, mm. in Milwaukee, you know, we were at a 50% restriction. And I had one restaurant that was in the that was in a county park under a different jurisdiction altogether. And they they wanted 25% restriction. And when we started organizing our business model, then we did a little bit of research and we read through what their restrictions were. And it's like, and that included your staff. So I had a restaurant that sat 180 customers go down to 43 people. Um, including your staff. So at 25 or 30 people, how many people could I, so do we open it? Yeah, I mean, it's one of our signature restaurants. It's in like, I opened it last in the opening because I knew that it would have the hardest time. Um, and we we got creative with our menus. We we wrote different menu styles and, and menus so that we could uh, take them on a journey to France or take them on a journey throughout Italy, uh, take them on a journey here to New England and offer them more creative ways to do a menu where we knew that we could add more value, better experience, but get sort of a little bit more of a price point that we knew we could rely, that we could build a model that would at least like break even or make a little yeah. money. I simply didn't have the, the, the wallet to run negative just to stay open. It had to at least wash its own face and stay in the black. And, um, and we also, when we closed, you know, 17 restaurants, we had millions of dollars of payables um, when the faucet City. shuts off because we're in a cash City. conversion business. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, all those January and February invoices, some laggering December, you know, showed up. And all of a sudden, all the restaurants are closing. These all these invoices are piling up week after week because we're on 45 and 60 days or whatever. And some of the, the vendors, depending who they are. And all of a sudden, you're sitting on these bills and, and, You've been paying your employees while you're closed and you've been doing right by your employees and you give away all the food and all of a sudden you're like, okay, when it when will I completely run out of money and games up on 30 years worth of work or 20, 27, 28 years worth of, of our life's work? And at some point I had to just say, hey, we went from 960 employees to 12 and and then we rebuilt. That's the past. It, 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 to me, it's like it's like a story. It doesn't even seem real it anymore. Seem real. It doesn't seem real. So at this point, I'm looking, you know, that's sort of the rearview mirror conversation. We're excited about opening the Commodore out in Lake Country, and we're cool. excited about evolving our menus, and and we're excited about about uh, launching and announcing the things we're doing for our 30th anniversary celebration, celebration of Milwaukee in a way, because it really isn't, you know, we wouldn't be here without the support of the community. and. And then even when we were closed in COVID, people were coming in and saying, I'm buying $15,000 gift cards for my for my employees. And, and then I had people say, by the way, we're not even going to re redeem any of our rewards points until <laughs> we know you're out of this. Oh. We, you, you know, you guys have to survive. Like, <clears throat> like, like they were like telling me, we're here. What do you need? And, and our vendors too, they were, you know, they were there. So when Joe and I built our values, we started with employees first, take care of your employees, take care of your guests. Happy employees, happy guests. Take care of your relationships, your partners, your landlords, your stakeholders, uh, your vendors, 
anybody that you interact with, be transparent, be forthcoming, be timely, you know, be open about communication. And so we called all of them and, and said, here's where we are. And every promise we made to everybody, we met. Um, any obligations we had, we met. And then um, you then give back to the community. Joe and I, uh, early on, um, grew up in a home. We called it the Bartholta table and symbolically it actually sits in our office. Uh, I had it after my brother passed, uh, We I did a little sort of founder's wall. Uh, so we never forget from where we come and my brother's role in, uh, yeah. in making this company so great. And then, um, but I really wanted people to understand that, you know, that my, my brother Joe, my sister Maria and Felicia and I came from the same womb. We came from the same family. All four of us had different life journeys, but we're the same people. And I realized that the table in a way was symbolic of how we learned as a family the values of who we are. Those values drove the values of our company. They drive our decisions every day. They always have, they always had, they always will. Um, and I brought the table, I had to re, you know, refurbish a little bit and it sits symbolically uh, in the office because I want everybody to understand that this is who we are and our goal now is to bring the Bartolotta table, our values, because you ask him, how do you do 30 years? We don't do 30 years, our team does 30 mm -hmm. years. Our community embraces our team. Mm -hmm. um, we are proud that we have north of 70 employees that are more than 15 years. We have many that are 20 and many that are 25 years as well as a whole group of young sort of next generation young people that are learning and and coming in and really making a difference and making us a young and vibrant company too we've also seen our demographic in our restaurants shift uh younger uh more diverse it's just the city society is changing yeah. and our businesses so i think the answer to the question is you know you know, restaurants don't get tired, owners do. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're tired. I am certainly not tired. And I and I wanna continue to keep and grow and evolve this business. Yeah. And there's more out there. You, like you say, the, we're in this industry, we're famous for being innovative and taking a, a shitty <laughs> position and making it work. You know, like we're, we're I would an say industry of grinders. Shitty and is the understatement of all time because I will, you know, anybody, like I said to you when I'm in the restaurant business, well, we all make mistakes, you know. <laughs> um, I, I'm right. I'm blessed because I do something I love. Yeah. Uh, I haven't worked a day in my life and yet I work my tail off. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like something I believe in, something that's part of who I am. Um, you know, when we were kids growing up uh, in Wauwatosa, my parents didn't have a lot, but whatever they did, they shared with the with the neighborhood. Every Saturday, every Sunday, it was like lunch at the Bartolottis, right? They would all come over and it would be like, go down the east side, buy salumi, time bread, cheese, olives. You know, there was always a smorgasbord. There was always a, uh, a buffet, uh, a series of antipasti out there and my dad would make pasta or he'd make octopus salad or things that just, you know, oh my God, you know, we'd have snails. My friends would be like, oh, they look like boogers, you know? And and all my <laughs> friends were like, you know, and I, when I was a kid, uh, I remember going to school with uh, my lunchbox. You remember those metal lunch pails? Yeah, and course. I remember running to school in like third grade and I was running late, fashionably late, always late, not much has changed. And I threw it up my coat and I threw my lunchbox down and I ran into class because I was running late. And by midday, there was this awful stench in the hallway. <laughs> and it turned out that when they opened up my lunch pail, which was sitting on the radiator, you know, the oh, hot, like today oh, would yeah. be a liability, the burning hot, yeah. you know, scalding radiator. When they opened it up, the whole hallway, it was like smell, because my dad had made me an octopus salad. And I was like in third grade or something. And I went home and said, dad, <laughs> Dad, I don't want any of this Italian stuff anymore. I, I want a ham sandwich. I want bag of chips. I want an apple <laughs> like all my friends. I don't want to be like Italian. And little did I know that, that that was already the gift that they were giving me. Yeah. I just didn't know it then. Uh -huh. And you know, we're taught to conform. Uh, in reality, we need to celebrate 
the cultural diversity of everybody around us because whether you're Italian or Irish or Jewish or, or you know, whatever your heritage or your ethnic or your background is, you come from an element or something that revolves around food and the table. It's the, it's the, it's the global place where sure people is. celebrate whether you, you know, eat with your hands like in some countries or not. It didn't matter, but you had that connection to your heritage. And so we need to celebrate all of that. I and agree. we did it. And in our home, uh, which is where we learned to celebrate and host people, um, we were also um, a family that that helped those that were less fortunate even than uh, we were not doing that great either. But we were we were taught to take care of everybody. The word care is so critical. You know, we care about everybody. We care about everything. We care about employees. We care. We care. We care. We care. We just happened to do it in the restaurant business. But my parents would would take in people that were you know in the middle of a divorce or somebody had cancer and they had nobody to take care of them and they would move in with us and my dad would be like son you have to give up your bedroom for for jerry and i'd be like for how long he's like well as long as it takes for him to get back on his feet and you know and there were friends of my father's you know that had you know health issues or you know financial trauma or or divorce or whatever and they would come and live with us friends of my mother and they would live with us and i'd be, I'd be on the couch you know i got kicked out of my room and and, and it wouldn't be like for a night or two, it'd be like for months. And in some cases there were years <laughs> that we had borders in our house. We never asked anything. And they became part of our family they ate with us every day and they were part of our home. And and they were just, we did right by people. This is like who we are. It's a natural feeling. For us, you, it's normal. Yeah, it's a natural feeling. It's very normal. And actually it's funny because I've actually taken in people. I had a couple of my, my chefs in the past that had, you know, marriage breakdowns and one that had an alcoholism problem and and he moved into my house he lived with me for more than a year and it's just my daughter understood that i said this is how we take care of people this is what we do i think there's a lot of giving up on people i think there's a lot of giving up on people you know i, I try not to do that you know a mistake here or whatever there but you know we really have to extend a hand you know when it's the hardest for folks and well it makes us feel uncomfortable you know we are we are what we are in this business. And it's about taking care of people end of the day. Tough business. Tough business. So tell me. Rewarding. Um, very. Re and it's, you know, a conversation like this for me at this point in my career is absolutely as rewarding as learning something, you know, 20 years ago. Because, you know, I'm embarking on a new, you don't know, but I'm embarking on a new set of you know, ideas and ideals for myself after all of this. And mm -hmm. it's harder for my little places to afford me being around. And I've got to find a way, you know, I started a frozen food company in my mom's name and the Moochie's cool. brand name, you know, just another way to reach out because, you know, I think my dream was, you know, have five restaurants, have 10 restaurants. And that's how you, that's where I was back in the day. That's where, it, that's what the path looks like for us, you know? Mm -hmm. And now and I'm like, hmm, I don't know, you know? I think it's pretty interesting that, you know, a couple of years changes the whole dynamic. And yet uh, I see you standing firm to your values because that's what matters. And it's just going to keep you going. I wanted to ask, though, about food at home when you were a kid. You said they had the antipasti. My grandmother. Sunday was sugo. Sugo Sundays. Like, uh, and pork rib or like ground pork. meat. Pork rib and my dad's meatballs, which was funny because when I moved to Italy, I, I all the years I lived there, I never ate a meatball. <laughs> Do they have them? <laughs> I mean, they have polpettine. Yeah, they make different things. But, but not like we know these big gnarly meatballs. And I, I used to make fun. And my dad said, yeah, dad, I'd eat your meatballs on Sunday and I'd still be burping up the garlic on Wednesday. <laughs> you know, and, but they were delicious, but laden with garlic. I mean, mm -hmm. just like you were just like sweating garlic after you ate it. But they are... He had, that recipe is delicious. So it, and part of my tradition. Yeah. Grandmother, she'd wake up um, in the morning. She'd always be out there with her nervous hands, kind of with her coffee, noni, right? Mm -hmm. You know, sitting there and I'd get up. She's like, you want the breakfast? I'm like, yes. I, yes. She would go and she poached me a couple of eggs, super soft, buttered toast, shit ton of Pecorino Romano cheese, cracked black pepper, anytime I wanted it. And it was just like a simple thing that Noni made for me and I'll never ever forget it. I made it for my kids, you know, like this, these are things. Sugo obviously in the house. Mom would have that cooking on Sundays. Yep. We were Methodist and that Catholic because my dad, he screwed me up in a lot of ways. My mom was the Italian one that made uh -huh. me who I am, thank God. But you know, you come home and you smell the sauce cooking and there's just a way it smells. 
Remember that? I do. And I then, do. And, and then, we had a dog. We had a dog. Uh, we had a Tibetan terrier named Tara. And, um, you know, we'd be feeding her pasta and she'd had this red mustache, <laughs> you know, all week long because she'd, we'd, my dad served her pasta with tomato sauce. Uh, probably not the nicest thing, best thing for a dog, but, but she certainly loved it. She couldn't wait till it was Sunday for pasta, you know, like she knew. So it sounds like the kitchen duties in your childhood were split between your mom and your dad. Weekdays was my mom, weekends with my dad, for sure. For sure. Weekdays with my mom. She was like the caregiver, taking care of the kids. And then during the weekends, my dad would like pick up the slap. Are they both and Italian? My mom is German Austrian and um, and my father was Sicilian mm -hmm. on my father's side. Yes. And then do you have sorry, I just I just love this part. Do you do you have family in Italy that you go visit or is it more friends there? Or do you have relatives still? Around? So it's an interesting story. So uh, 1977, my sister got invited on a trip to Sicily. My dad wouldn't send her by herself, so I had to go and chaperone, if you can imagine. <laughs> and we end up going to, uh, to Sicily, and I'm sort of the chaperone, and we meet these guys and, and uh, these two waiters at the hotel that were sort of hit up by my sister, and, and but I had to sort of chaperone, and oh, you know, we said, you know, we're from this town called Santo Seventy Camastra, and he goes, oh, it's right down the road here. He said, you wanna go there? And I said, yeah, we'd like to see if we have any like relatives. So we drive down there, we come to the main square, and the first thing we see is Barbara Talata, and we're like, oh my God, we're home. So we walk in, we start talking to everybody, <laughs> couldn't find any connection, go to the city hall, call the guy from the police, whatever. And we kind of got no, we talked to a couple of priests who looked in some of the halls of records and we spent the entire day like, and near the end of the day, it was like just about getting ready to get dark. And, and we went back to the, the bar bar to have a coffee and, and, um, and uh, the, the elderly gentleman behind the bar said, you know, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I know that there's going to be some relation, but we don't know how there are lots of Bartolotas here. And, and there's an elderly man sitting in the corner and he goes, he says something in Italian. He says, you know, why don't you ask one of the elders? And he said, and the guy behind the bar says to the police, yeah, that's a good idea. Why don't you ask so-and-so? So we get out, we walk up this hill, this kind of streets of San Francisco, went up like two hills to this house. I know exactly where it is in the village. And he rings the doorbell and this elderly woman comes, very frail, tiny little woman, all dressed in black, very classic morning, <laughs> morning attire since her husband was gone. All dressed, and, Forever, he come, yes. and he says, you know, we're here with these men. They're, they're, they, they're, their name is Bartolotto, they're from Milwaukee and blah, blah, blah. And you know, they're looking for their background and she waves us in. We go upstairs, she makes a pot of espresso, she puts out some biscotti and whatever, a little mocha and some, and whatever, and we're sitting there, and she opens the top drawer of her credenza, she pulls out a couple of these uh, tins, you know, those metal tins, and she opens up and she starts pulling out pictures of my father, my grandfather, uh, pictures of my grandmother, my uncles, and turns out that she was my, uh, my, my grandmother's sister. And she told it through the translator, because at the time I didn't speak a word of Italian, uh, very, very little. And she explained that I was, um, that she knew her sister had passed when the letters stopped coming. And that was the end of the story. And so, you know, we tried to stay connected with her. She passed within, you know, a short window after that. And then years later, I took my parents on a trip to go back to the village and we find a little more, we meet a couple of people that are, and we open up this door, this home with my mom and dad. This was when I was at San Domenico in like 1990. And we, I took a trip to my, to Italy, my father had never been. So I, I had saved all my money and I took my parents, my mom and dad on a trip to Italy um, cause they had never been to the homeland. And I had already lived there for, for seven and a half years, but my parents had no money and I was an apprentice pretty much working free. I had no money. So my first real job was at San Domenico. So I worked a hundred hours a week for the first several years. I stockpiled a little bit of money. And I said, the first thing I'm gonna do is take my parents to Italy. So oh, I took no my mom kidding. and dad on a trip to Italy. I took them to, um, <sighs> to Santo Stefano. I took them all over. They went to a bunch of restaurants that I'd apprenticed at and worked at. I took them to Venice. I took them to Milan. I took them to Florence. Um, I took him to San Domenico. I took him all through Italy, uh, down to Rome. And then we flew from Rome down to Sicily. Um, and then I rented a car there and we went to find some of our roots. We go back to this village, we found this family. We open the door and there's this gentleman who's uh, related to us because we found out from the woman who we were related to. And we, a guy opens the door and he looks just like my uncle Sam. Oh man. Like, and we're Those like, we know, we're, we know we're connected because you look, you're the doppelganger you of my yeah. uncle Sam. <laughs> And so we make these connections. <clears throat> I keep it relatively 
in contact but not not doing a great job. And about oddly enough, about nine months ago, I got a call from this guy and he goes, My name is Alessio, and I, and he sends me sends me a WhatsApp and he goes, Are you Paul Bartolotta, the chef? I said, I am. And he goes, My name's Alessio, I'm your fifth cousin. I'm like, okay, fifth cousin. From where? I'm from Santo Stefano. Okay. My best friend is the mayor. My schoolmate friend is now the mayor. And I'm an investigative journalist for Correa della Sera in Milano, which is this, the New York Times, as you know, of, of Italy. And so he's uh, so he tells me, I've been doing some research on you, and I'd like to invite you to get the keys to the city of Santo Stefano. Um, I've been in charge to find 50 people who have gone out in the world from roots with Santo Stefano and sort of done something. And, and then and he goes, and by the way, um, I know a lot of people that you know, and we're starting to connect with like chefs and people that he knows. And, and sure enough, he's like, and by the way, I did research on your family um, because a couple of years before that I had gotten my Italian passport. I got far enough along in my research to get my passport, but I kind of hit a wall where I couldn't go further. And he's going back to like the 1700s and the 1600s of my family tree. Oh my God. And then he starts sending me pictures of like the headstones of my grandmother and grandfather here at Holy Cross Cemetery in Milwaukee, Federica and and Because they had him sent over there when they passed, right? Uh, I, I don't know how he found it, but he's an investigative journalist, so he found everything. It's incredible what this guy came up with. So then I was invited to the Vatican in May of this of this past year to do uh, an olive oil conference uh, with the the uh, Academy of Pontifical Academy of Sciences. It's the Pope's um, academy that researches things to see how the Church's belief on things that are scientific hmm. rather than religious. Uh, the week after I was there doing an olive oil seminar, they were doing stem cell, just to give you an idea, like research to inform the Pope on various thoughts and things so the Pope can have wow. advisors to create a position on the church's position on an ever-evolving world where science is having a bigger impact. Impact, And he was supportive of, of the olive oil for many reasons. One, because he's terribly worried about famine, his number one, and food waste, the Pope. But also because it's become something important, the olive, uh, the olive branch, olive oil has lots of religious symbolism, anointing of the sick, and so on and so forth. But furthermore, if you think about it, the uh, the the world is warming. We have we have legitimate global warming happening. Some people are denying it. Fair enough. Everybody has an opinion. I don't share that. When I talk to people that are in agriculture, they can confirm with me yeah. the world is changing. They're picking olives two months earlier. They're mm. picking grapes a month earlier, two months earlier. The world is changing. And the Pope is terribly worried about that. And the olive um, can live in very arid climate, doesn't require regular farming, um, can live with almost no water, um, doesn't need lots of herbicides and pesticides to protect it because it's survived millennia, so it's really resilient. Mm. And um, and it's a natural fruit and a natural oil. Um, and so the Pope is really supportive of taking a deeper dive. So I was invited, one of 30 people invited to this conference on olive oil at the Vatican, and he was happened to be there on business. So I spent a day and a half with my fifth cousin and I got to know him and heard more about what's coming up this upcoming summer. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. So I, I do have connections now. Uh, that's deeper so cool. And growing. My sister, I, I've been there alone. My sister went back with my, my sister went back with my mom just recently. We're from San Marcello de Piostiese. Where? Uh, San Marcello, but it would, north would, of Prato. In, oh, so you're Toscano. Just, yes. Say Toscano. Say Toscano. I lived in, uh, my daughter went to high school in Florence. So she spent five years living in Florence. She went to the International School of Florence. So my wife uh, and her took an apartment in Florence for five years. It was going to be a year, then became two years, then became five years. And I'd go back and forth. I'd go from Vegas to Milwaukee, Milwaukee to, to Florence, Florence, Crazy. Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Vegas. That was my route. And um, and it was great because my wife and I, I kept saying to my wife, you didn't meet some Italian man or something. He's like, no, 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 no. He said, Julie is very happy here. I love it. I've made a network of friends. And the best part, Paul, is when you're here, you're actually here. You're not thinking and working. Mm. You're like focused on being with me or in a green space where you're out eating Italian food and you know visiting winemakers and like reconnecting with all your roots. She said, it's really great to see you in this element and how happy you are mm. to be to have your feet on the ground in Italy. Um, and so my daughter went to the international school. I spent a lot of time there, so Do I'm you have quite any property there. That's a personal question. So the answer is working on it. One of the things in our long-term plan is to 
maybe uh, own a small winery or uh, a production of olive oil or a small trattoria, yeah, agriturismo, or something in Florence. So I've already begun the hunt, and I have a bunch of people who actually have winemakers who are interested in having me do a sort of a joint venture with them because I like to leave it to my daughter. It's really not so much about me. It's about spending more time in Italy, but leaving something for Julia. Um, she has real roots in Italy, you know, so for her it's important uh, to stay connected with that. Um, and uh, and to leave her something. So um, maybe it's a JV where we, you know, partner with a winery and do a little like Agriturismo as part of their hospitality center, and we get a little home or a little place as part of it. And uh, the you know, romance of that thought. I yeah, mean, yeah, that's it, right? Amazing. That would be that would be, be that would be a lot arriving. For sure. That would be arriving. That would be like that that moment of your career. Where you're like, ha, ah, you know, this is what I've always wanted. Even though this is what you've always wanted in a way. But you know, there's an end game. There's a way to. It's ever evolving. It's ever evolving. And I and I, as I was saying, I was just in uh, Vegas speaking at a finance conference, and this guy was speaking about um, the longevity economy, and I was so impressed with him because he made me realize that there's a whole new group of people that are going to live 85 to 100 that are taking on that fourth career, that fourth period in their life, and it continued to inspire me to say, "Hey, I'm just getting started here. We got juice. Yeah, we got juice. Absolutely." I I'm feel like I'm going to work down. till I'm, I'm going. 70. I really, you know, like I, I probably have to now, but. I don't think I'll ever really fully <laughs> retire. I just don't, I just, I want to be involved. I want to be active. Yeah. I be, but I want to, I want to also enjoy my life because I've always been a liver. You know, I've always been somebody who, who enjoyed living my life. Yeah. Skiing and sailing and, and dining and traveling and visiting different places. Uh, I've always been wanting input. I've always wanted to have new experiences. It saves us along the way from, you know, the old. Banal, banalties of life. For you, yeah. I think if I said that right, but yeah. you know, like the humdrum, and uh, you know, we have uh, similarities that way. And in, in skiing, this industry, the folks kind of have a fabric that we work from, and we need a little bit of that, that gratification, and a little wild. And um, like I said, it's really nice to see your energy flowing into 2023. I see where you're, where you're heading. It's all good. I also lived in Vegas for a little bit. What a crazy time! I know you. What uh, years were you there? I opened the Bellagio. That was 98 to almost 2000. My wife and I went out. I worked for Sam DeMarco. It's, uh, it's I know Sam. Right? For sure. Sam's Club. Sure. And uh, then I worked with, uh, we, we got pregnant in Vegas. It was so much fun and didn't really feel like it was the place to raise a child. So we moved to Minneapolis. And that's where I met up with Marcus Samuelson. And worked with him for sure. a couple of years there. Cool, and I know Marcus very well. I mean, I've done some radio shows with him. Yeah. I've done tons of events with no, him. No, he's yeah. he's super approachable guy. Uh, love him, and, and yeah, and me I'm really too. really great to watch too. all of his success too. Yes, oh yeah. my god, that's yeah. what I said to him when I saw him. He came through um, to do a dinner with Gavin, Swedish here. Ethiopian. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and he's super just, great I mean, guy. and his, his colorful ways and his attitude and his verve, like, uh, I picked up so much from him, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of legacy, you know, you got 30 years down, mm -hmm. say 30 more, no problem. Well, 30 might be a reach, but, <laughs> but you know, make no small plans. Uh, but you mentioned Gavin. It's like, you know, I know you come from that area. Uh, Gavin's a dear friend and, and he's great for Minneapolis and he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's so happy. He's raising a beautiful family. He's a, he's a family man. He's a super hard worker. He's a really talented chef. We're both very active at mentor supporting team USA and our young chef and Comi competition and things. And so, so shout out to Gavin for all he does. Absolutely. Um, he's it's a friend a and a colleague and, yeah. oh, I admire him so much. You know, he, it was Marcus who who kind of first started bringing chefs from out of town. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a dinner with Trotter. I did mm -hmm. a dinner with uh, sure. the Spirito, sure. uh, uh, Paul uh -huh. Kahn. I mean, yeah. all that, like, yeah. you know, anybody you'd really want to, and, and I just love that. And then Gavin's like, mm. obviously now these are our new, newer heroes, but yeah. some of these Synergy series, sure. so good, yeah. so good. So I have, a, I have a little something for you. I, you know, it's kind of weird. Given a guy with 17 restaurants of Mucci's lasagna. Oh, but cool. In, in the name of Oh my gosh, Audrey. this is awesome. So I've, got, I've got a few more here. i got a vegetable. i got a baked penne with meatballs. And this is my project taking... Very exciting. Taking what I know, family foods. This is the exact same stuff that my mom puts in hers. We had to like layer it differently so it doesn't have the same textures. But 
really mm-hmm. good ingredients, no antibiotics, pecorino romano cheese from <laughs> where it needs to be from. It's really good. I hope um, I hope there's a, I'll imagine you one Sunday afternoon, maybe plopping on your couch and eating Sooner than you know. <laughs> Eat some mooches. Lasagna. Yeah, I called my wife and said, "Tonight, are you up for some lasagna?" <laughs> you know, my absolute yeah, pleasure. Yeah, very cool. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Kate Meyer, uh, this lovely woman in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, started uh, an apron, an apron company. It's called Craft Made Aprons, mm-hmm. and she's uh, just fighting through a lot of personal battles on her own, physical health and whatever. But sorry to hear that she's like just an inspiration to me and I think a lot of people in the city. They also have a part of their company that's Black Blue, works on uh, mental health for folks in our industry. And anyway, I hope you don't mind. I hope you, I hope, and, and no obligation obviously to liking it, but I brought you a little apron that's really made by thoughtful. Kate and their, and their company. And I hope um, uh, that I get to see you again in another, in another way maybe. Okay, now a, that we're doing the gift exchange. Can you run and grab me a white and a red? See what they have? I see what they have here. I, I'm not sure what they have left. I know we're <laughs> run on it, but go get it. We're doing our gift exchange. Uh, so we have a private label wine that we uh, we have at the, oh, we're fantastic. selling in the restaurants. Um, and I I, um, I looked all over to find varietals that I are lesser known. So one is a Nascetta. It's a white wine mm. uh, from Pimonte. It was almost extinct and a handful of producers kept it alive and makes a delicious, minerally well-balanced kind of everyday wine. And I've always loved the Barbera as a varietal. Yeah. It doesn't get the the the, the, the love and uh, attention and appreciation that Nebbiolo or Sangiovese or Sangiovese Grosso or, you know, you know, uh, Nero Davola or whatever, you know, uh, but it's delicious wine. Yeah. And so I... I have this uh, one is the red wine is uh, we call it the heritage collection because we want to support and let people know that this is named after uh, Giuseppe, my grandfather. And then the white wine is named after my nonna, uh, Federica. And then we have these two wines that tell a little bit of the story about the history of our company. There we go. And. If I may take a moment just to read the back. Yes, Thank of course. Thank you so much for bringing Thank these you, in. Thank you, Jane. So on the picture, on the front, you see Federica uh-huh. called the Heritage Collection. And this is Giuseppe, my grandfather, for the red. And on the back, I did a little short thing, which may kind of tie everything together. The happiest memories of my childhood were at our family table, the Bartolotta table where food, wine, and stories of our grandparents journey to America. The conviviality instilled by our grandparents, Nona Federica and Giuseppe, made it the gathering place for, for friends and family and the heart of our home. This is the foundation of the Bartolotta family hospitality upon which my brother Joe and I created the first of many restaurants and tables, beginning with Ristorante Bartolotta in 1993. The Heritage Collection pays homage to Federica and Giuseppe Bartolotta and all those no longer at our table, but yet forever remaining in our hearts. My brother and my parents and everybody else. So yeah. this is Thank you. for you, sir. I really appreciate it A beautiful it so 2021 much. Barbera and a 2020 Nascetta. And they drink great. And I'm super proud. I have a friend of mine who produced them for me. And on the back, you can see uh, a little sketch of the original, our first restaurant mm-hmm, there on the back. The corner. So yeah. Super proud of it. Well, from, from, uh, so thank you for res- these lovely yes, gifts. It's a pleasure from, with respect to the past and res- with uh, respect to the future. Thank you. And thanks and for taking an interest and, in, and including me in your, in your podcast. Yeah. We're really excited. It's, Absolutely. it's an honor that you thought of us. It's an honor to be here with you. Thanks a lot, Paul. Very good. Never, 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 sir. The Milwaukee episodes. Thank you so much. There you go.